Hey, this video is brought to you by NordVPN. If there's one thing that is absolutely indispensable in the age of information, it's the ability to protect it. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network, and what it does is encrypts your internet traffic and conceals your IPs so that third parties, including your internet provider, can't spy on your activity. In the densely packed streets of today's internet traffic, a VPN is like your seatbelts, and Nord is who I choose to keep my data safe. Plus, if the sense of security wasn't enough, having access to Nord VPN means I can bypass country-specific limitations on the experience experiences I care about. Can't watch Ghibli movies on Netflix in the US? No problem. Just a few simple clicks and as far as streaming services are concerned, I'm tapping in from Germany to vibe to some kikis. Live in a country where services like Discord are banned? Good news, you just moved from Dubai to Canada and you didn't even have to pack your bag. And with a 30 day money back guarantee, there's no downsides to giving it a spin around the old digital block. Right now, you can get 68% off a two year plan plus one additional month for free when you go to nordvpn.com breadsword or use the code breadsword at checkout. Take control of your internet experience today and make sure your data stays cozy and safe. That's nordvpn.com slash breadsword or the code breadsword at checkout. Oh man, okay. Yo, it's your boy, back at it again with another delicate and incisive discussion on the magic of cinema. Uh, maybe you noticed the world kind of plunged into a hellfire of darkness back there in like March. And since then, I've pretty much just been in the crib, sort of pacing around and trying to keep myself busy. Last month, I bought a Roomba and named him Bobby. And now when he wakes up to clean, I just sort of follow him around to see what he's got going on. So I'm doing good. Since the lockdown started though, I've been nurturing this sort of renewed obsession, a, a bit of monomania, if you will. One that I had previously managed to contain for some time, but as the isolation has set in, it's taken more and more of a precedence over my thoughts, my ideas, and even my dreams. A question, one that has haunted me for as long as I can remember. An enigma emblazoned so sharply in my mind, it has refused me any acquaintance with peace until it is answered. And so for this particularly pestilent Hallow's End, we're going to solve the greatest mystery of my childhood and adult life, which are mostly indistinguishable. And we're going to do it together. Without further ado, I present to you a query of Scoobs, not one, not two. Beneath full moon will soon contend with all manner of flicks from root to end. And a cauldron made from light, not mortar, will unmask the unrivaled and will do it in order. Halloween is here, so to put it to rest, this is the curious quest of Scooby-Doo's best film. Scooby-Doo's, Scooby-Doo's best film. In the game, I lost you. What a price to pay! Hey, I'm crying. Ooh. Before we embark on our most hallowed holiday hunt for the best Scooby flick in the bunch, I think it'd be best if we begin it refreshed. So, what is Scooby-Doo? I'm glad you asked. Scooby-Doo is a cartoon Great Dane created by Joe Ruby and Ken Spears, alongside the series which bears his name. Before its myriad of rewrites and a redesign from Disney character designer Iwao Takamoto, Scooby began his life in The Mysteries 5, the original name for Scooby-Doo Where Are You, as a dog named Too Much, who was sometimes a sheepdog and played the bongos. After the duo pitched a series of CBS under a new name, Who's Scared in 1969, Fred Silverman, head of daytime programming in CBS, decided they should rename the dog after the doobie Dooby Doo part at the end of Frank Sinatra's Strangers in the Night, because he'd heard it on a red-eye flight on the way to one of their development meetings. And the phrase Scooby-Doo with a K was a common Cockney slang for the word clue. This change of name, along with a toning down of the series' scarier parts, now emphasizing its comedy instead, 
got them the green light to start production for the upcoming season. And not a moment too soon. See, in 1968, a bunch of parent-run child advocacy groups, you know, ones like Moms for Moral Stability, decided to put the kibosh on kids enjoying cool things that are fun by protesting against what they perceived as excessive violence in American cartoons. And due to the absolute political pressure cooker that the country was in at the time, series began to drop left and right, and a whole shitload of them happened to be from the big HB. All the iconic series from Hanna-Barbera's heyday, The Adam Ant Show, Space Ghost and Dino Boy, Birdman and the Galaxy, Trio, The Herculoids, Wacky Races, Fantastic Four, Frankenstein Jr. and The Impossibles? Frankenstein Jr. and The Impossible? The cultural wasteland that would decades later comprise 90% of Adult Swim's a referential toolkit. So, um, shout outs act for Space Ghost Coast to Coast, I guess? Anyways, their entire lineup being laid bare spelled big trouble in Little China for the Barbs. Because not only did they need to replace some of the most beloved characters in American animation at the time, they needed to do so with a fraction of the action. Scooby-Doo Where Are You premiered at the end of 1969, followed closely by Josie and the Pussycats. In many ways, it's sister series because they were both inspired by the same productions, The Archies and The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis, the first American sitcom to feature teenagers as its main characters. If you ever wonder why the earliest episodes characterize Mystery Inc. as a band, and why the later series and films occasionally reference the gang's musicality, it's because before there was Fred, Daphne, Velma, Shaggy, and Scooby, the nomadic mystery-solving team of teens, there was Jeff, Mike, Kelly, Linda, WW, and Too Much, who played the bongos in the Mysteries 5, their band. The series' initial treatment portrayed them as a touring musical act, only happening upon mysteries as they traveled from show to show the character dynamics being more or less direct reflections to the Archies. Ruby and Spears cut the number of non-dog characters down to four, bumping too much into a position of equal prominence and emphasizing more of the elements it inherited from Dobie Gillis. The gang took on some of the characteristics and aesthetic qualities of the show's cast, giving birth to Fred's part in sometimes misplaced confidence, Velma's braininess and modesty, Daphne's beauty and affluence, and Shaggy's iconic chin scruff and stupidity. Finally, the gang had taken shape as the mystery ink we all know and love. And along with them receiving shiny new names, Scooby received his now iconic design. Takamoto said while designing Scooby, he actually consulted with someone at Hanna-Barbera who bred Great Danes and deliberately created Scooby to be as far away as possible from a dog anyone would want to take to a show, which is super fucking mean. People must have loved it though, because over the next decade, Hanna-Barbera made like a zillion iterations on their new Scoob formula. Seriously, there's like a ton of them. Almost every series HB produced in the 70s is a group of young people either solving mysteries or playing music with an animal or both. It's like a genuinely bizarre programming block to look at. You got your Ghost Chasers, your Speed Buggy, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kids, Jabberjaw, the Amazing Chan and the Chan Clan, Clue Club, the new Shmoo, and a personal favorite, the Funky Phantom, a teen-solving mystery series where Scooby's role is filled by a revolutionary war-era ghost. It wasn't long before the company realized instead of creating funhouse mirror, inferior versions of their already beloved series after they ended, shout outs to the Roman Holidays. They could just revisit them. Two years after Scooby-Doo Where Are You's company-saving run had ended, Hanna-Barbera announced the new Scooby-Doo movies, setting in motion one of the longest-running and successful animated franchises in American history. 14 TV series, 11 specials, 14 comic runs, 20 video games, and 5 plays. And that's why I have to know what the best movie in the Scooby-Doo canon is. I mean, how many could there be? 10? 15? This will be easy. There are 44 fucking Scooby-Doo movies. What? All right, um, I guess we should get started then. Let's see which one of these 44 films got the fright stuff. Someday I am going to die. All right, here's how this is gonna work. Numbered list, worst goes first, and we're gonna bundle the bottom five because I literally cannot stand thinking about them anymore. Number 44 through 40 are the collected live action works. We're talking Scooby-Doo 2002, Monsters Unleashed, Curse of the Lake Monster, Mystery Begins, and Daphne and Velma. Curse of the Lake Monster and the Mystery Begins are at 44 and 43 respectively because they share all the major flaws of the other live action works. 
minus their only redemptive qualities, namely their cast and their solid soundtracks. It isn't really a surprise these are the least enjoyable of the least enjoyable because these are both prequels, which are already almost impossible to make good when they are preceding good movies. I'll give Mystery Begins this though, its antagonist is voiced by Daniel Riordan, who voiced Alduin, so it did make me smile, just not in the way I think it wanted me to. Number 42 is Daphne and Velma. You know when your friend describes a video game to you and you get really excited based on their description of the video game and you buy it, and you install it, and and you, and you play it, you're, you know, you're excited to play it with your friend who told you how cool it was. And you get maybe 10 minutes into it and you're like, ah, I'm not having fun. Number 41, Scooby-Doo 2002 is maybe the most aggressively turned of the millennium film I have ever seen. And I have a love-hate relationship with it because of that. On one hand, it introduces us to Matthew Lillard as Shaggy, which is like a top 10 all-star casting choice of all time. And its soundtrack is stacked for like no reason. It hurts me that of all the films we could have had Outkast, Killer Mike, and Salon John at the same time, it was the live action Scooby-Doo where Shaggy and a CG Scooby have a fart contest that ends with Shaggy earnestly shitting himself. However, credit where it's due, it does have the most compelling premise of the live action works. Mystery Inc. breaks up because Fred takes all the credit, Daphne is sick of being a damsel in distress, and Velma is tired of not getting the props she deserves, leaving Shaggy and Scooby to care for the van. The gang are individually summoned to Spooky Island, a scare resort owned by Emil Mondavarius, and they're forced to band back together to solve its mystery. I love how contrived this reunion setup is because it's basically a slightly modified loop in the third part two first episode. And admittedly, it does have one cool set piece, which is the spooky castle, but I think I only really like it because it reminds me of Karazhan from World of Warcraft. Also, the choice to have Scrappy-Doo ultimately be its antagonist is mean. And like, he's only the antagonist because the gang are mean to him. He didn't deserve to go out like that. The thing about Scrappy that everyone knows, but nobody wants to admit, is that he is categorically the best member and he was forced to take a back seat in the Scoob canon because some people feared his power. Seriously, the first couple Scooby-Doo movies are Shaggy, Scrappy, and Scooby, and in them Scrappy displays better deductive reasoning, more bravery, more strength, and more resourcefulness than Velma, Fred, or Daphne. In Scooby-Doo meets the Boo Brothers, he literally solves the mystery himself. And in Ghoul School, he almost falls to his death and then holds a crunch with like two plates on his bar while smiling. He is fearless, he is brilliant, he is handsome. I literally do not know why people hate him. Tim Curry was originally slated to play Emil Mondavarius in this movie and said that he wouldn't, specifically said that he wouldn't because it involved Scrappy-Doo. Well, I think he's perfect. Fuck you, Tim Curry. Number 40, Scooby-Doo 2, Monsters Unleashed. In this one, Scooby-Doo plays a Game Boy Advanced SP and the entire film is functionally an hour and a half long Burger King commercial which is funny. Speaking of commercials, number 39 through 37 are another bulk for the bottom, the crossover films, specifically those which are nothing more than advertisements for the things they're crossing over with. This is Kiss Rock and Roll Mystery, WWE Curse of the Speed Demon, and Scooby-Doo WrestleMania Mystery. Not particularly creative names, not particularly creative films. I resent that I spent time watching them, so I'm gonna be ranking them on the amount of times Jinkies appears in their script. Kiss has one, Curse of the Speed Demon has two, WrestleMania has four. I walked into a mailbox yesterday and it left like a mark. Coming in at number 36 is Scooby-Doo and Arabian Nights, the most confusing movie in the entire series. This is another adventure without Fred, Daphne, or Velma, the fourth to be released after a six year hiatus following Reluctant Werewolf. And this time Scrappy is out of the picture as well, presumably because they didn't know how to suppress his natural dominance over every scene because they were cowards. Scooby and Shaggy touch down in Arabia on a flying carpet to become real food tasters for the Caliph, who is voiced and based on Eddie Deason, probably most well known as Mandark from Dexter's Laboratory. Shag and Scoob eat the Caliph's lunch, and after realizing they'll be executed for their gluttony, run away into the harem room where they then disguise themselves as women, and the Caliph falls in love with Fem Shag. So to delay the wedding and his death, Shaggy takes it upon himself to tell the Caliph two stories from the 1001 Nights. Stories that neither Shaggy or Scooby are in at all. This is a Scooby-Doo movie 
which is actually just an Arabian Nights movie, complete with a frame story featuring Megilla Gorilla as Sinbad and containing maybe, maybe six and a half minutes of screen time with actual Scooby-Doo characters in it. Watching this was the closest I felt to being robbed since the last time I was actually robbed. Number 35, Aloha. Scooby-Doo. Oh my God, this one is so weird. Okay, so your typical Scoob setup, right? The gang gets a free trip to Hawaii for some super contrived reason and they all think it'll be a really relaxing vacation, except uh-oh, plot happens because Mystery Inc. are like harbingers of doom and then they spend the rest of their time solving a mystery. They're there to see the big kahuna of Hanahuna surfing contest. But when they arrive, they learn that some contention between the contestants because it used to be a contest for native islanders and they've been forced to open it to mainlander Americans. Here's where shit goes left. Manu and his people have every right to be upset by this, and the film itself seems to agree with him at first, because the mainlanders present at the surfing contest are extremely disrespectful to the native islanders, Manu and Lil Jim in particular. But then the film's ending message is essentially that Manu is wrong, and you should let white people disrespect your culture, and if you don't, it's secretly because you want to steal your own people's land and buy it because you're the real problem. This is genuinely a really confusing watch. I mean, the entire time you're like, it's gotta be the weird white woman mayor lady or the creepy condominium guy who keeps referencing sacred land like it's an object. Or maybe they'll even do a fake out where it was actually the really rude surfer guy from the beginning of the film. But then the movie is like, no, actually instead of the aloof white politician who says things like, people love politicians who love dogs, or the condominium company guy who keeps talking about his culture like he doesn't care about it. It's the native islanders who have a problem with them who are the real enemy. And then to like back it up, they throw out this weird real estate scheme of Manu and his girlfriends that isn't even alluded to once in the entire movie. The shit is so uncomfortable to watch and like, I don't know. I don't know why Warner Brothers thought that was the move. The mayor lady strips Manu of his native title and literally gives it to a dog, which is like, Whatever. This movie has wonderful music and I love its setting and it has a fantastic chase sequence where every member of the gang gets to shine in their own vehicle. But the story itself is so jarring and clumsy that none of that can really salvage it from being a shitty time with an uncharacteristically shitty message. Look Daphne, I got a shot of a rare Nene. Wow! Number 34, Scooby-Doo Return to Zombie Island. A sequel to Jim Sinstrom's fantastic Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island and released 21 years after the fact, I don't think that there is another Scooby-Doo film so thoroughly disappointing as this one. In general, I'm of the belief that if your entry into a canon relies on callbacks to his past, you're already subconsciously aware of the fact that whatever you've added to it pales in comparison. And every time a game or movie does this, it makes me genuinely really sad. Uh, we'll touch on this more when we actually get to his films, but what made Senstrom's run of Scooby-Doo stories so immediately iconic is that the monsters in them were actually real. Beginning with Zombie Island, his first of four, he expresses his boredom with the formula of Scooby-Doo through Daphne and creates this really nice sort of careful what you wish for monkey's paw adventure from it. Return of Zombie Island is especially disappointing because it is a sequel to one of the most electrifying entries into the Scooby-Doo canon that is itself one of the most tedious and unengaging movies I have ever seen. A TV show hosted by Elvira announces Shaggy and the gang have won a trip to an island resort. And because of this multiple movie spanning semi-cohesive subplot where the sheriff of Coolsville wants them to retire, Shaggy and Scooby forces the gang to swear an oath that they will not investigate any mysteries on this vacation. And they stick to that oath for 37 minutes. This movie is so bizarre and like sad to watch. There's a part soon after arriving at the island where they're in this tourist van and they kind of come to this mutual realization that they aren't compatible as friends without the mutual interest of mystery solving. And the film just leaves it there, like it just cuts as if it agrees that this dynamic becomes excruciatingly annoying to watch when everyone has the same one note delusional level of skepticism. They insist that it's not actually Moonscar Island from the original film because the signs are painted over to say Moonstar instead. And when they arrive at the resort initially, there's like two uninterrupted minutes of exposition of the original film from Daphne. And it's played kind of like a joke almost, but 
the joke is on the film itself for being incredibly poorly written. Some Scooby-Doo movies feel like episodes, but Return to Zombie Island feels like a movie actively apologizing to its audience for not being better, while an actually fun movie takes place in its background. Can't even front, 50 minutes into the movie, I started shopping on my other monitor. Bought a Telfar bag. Patreon.com slash breadsword. Number 33 is Lego Scooby-Doo Haunted Hollywood. In retrospect, I almost feel like I should have been more generous with this one's placement because it's clearly not made for my weathered gamer brain. This is an especially baby mode movie. So keep in mind, everything I say about the Lego movies is a 24 year old's take on movies made for nine year olds. If there's something you consider checking out, I'm sure your younger siblings or your pets or whatever would really enjoy them. I'm not trying to be mean. Having said that, this shit is terrible. The basic premise is Scooby and Shaggy win a trip for a vacation. I don't know why the 21st century Scooby-Doo movies are obsessed with this setup. It gets old and it's for an all expenses paid trip to Hollywood. Fun fact, the joke I made back there about the last time I was robbed actually happened on Hollywood Boulevard. Shout out to the drunk Spider-Man who tried to force $238 out of my small supple hands. Anyways, the crew touch down and head to Brickton Studios, a Lego analog for Universal. And they quickly discovered that the studio is about to close due to plummeting box office and in part due to a haunting of their most famous star, Boris Karnak. I actually really appreciate this premise. I, I think it's brilliant to have a team with such a renowned rogues gallery to confront a place with its own of comparable distinction. And I even really appreciate the note that it ends on. One of the two antagonists end up being Atticus Fink, this producer who wanted to buy the studio on the low, because for some reason, 80% of Scooby-Doo antagonists are in it for real estate. But the second antagonist is the studio's most loyal employee, Junior. He reveals that he's actually the son of Boris Karnak and that he was haunting the studio so that it would return to its roots of creating wonderful monster movies. And everyone agrees that his heart was in the right place, so he's let go and they end up releasing the security footage of his haunting as a found footage film, which saves the studio and makes him a star. Super cute, it's a real feel good ending and concept, but in practice, this movie is just so mid. So many of its gags feel like commercials for how cool Legos are to play with, instead of like fun meta jokes about the fact that they are Legos. And the way they did girl Daphne in particular by stripping her of all of her physical strength and dexterity, transforming her into a super vapid and clumsy paperweight of the team, dramatically harms the dynamic of Mystery Inc. The music, which is always a prerequisite for a Scooby-Doo film, is synthetic and unexciting. And honestly, the un masking is just unsatisfying because there are Legos. There's this joke about 30 minutes in and it goes like, Direct? No, I can't direct. Ah, who says you can't? Well, I don't have an artistic point of view or any original ideas. What, are you kidding? You're a natural, baby. It's like a pot shot at the contemporary film industry or whatever, but honestly, I cannot think of a more apt description of this movie. Number 32, Scooby-Doo. Stage fright. In this Scooby-Doo take on X Factor meets Phantom of the Opera, somehow neither of these elements seem to be its primary focus, instead using most of its emotional pull that it can muster on Fred X Daphne fan fiction. This is more or less just a romance vehicle for the already canonically in like with each other couple, with these bizarre cultural appendages stapled over it to try to convince its audience that it's not. Girlsaurus Rex in classically characteristic Hanna-Barbera fashion is just a weird echo of their already established, already well-beloved, all-girl rock group of Scooby-Doo, the Hex Girls, which they could have just included instead. And the music throughout this film is distressingly bad, which I feel like is not a good sign when your movie is based on not one, but two different music-based cultural mainstays. Instead of one or a couple unmaskings, by the way, this film has like five. And instead of feeling like a keenly woven chain of fake out conclusions, after the second Phantom is revealed and the movie still isn't over, it just feels kind of spiritless probably would have been better if it had some ghosts. Number 31, Scooby-Doo in the Gourmet Ghost. Now we're entering what I like to call the okayish zone. Movies that aren't fantastic, but still edge out as passable, pretty fun times. It's important you keep that in mind because this next sentence is a bit to process. The Gourmet Ghost is a Scooby-Doo movie released in 2018 about political espionage during the American Revolutionary War, co-starring Bobby Flay as himself. The film opens with Mystery Inc. on their way to the Rocky Harbor Inn, where Fred's uncle Bobby invited them to chill for a few days, another vacation-turned-mystery setup. 
When they get there, the entire rest of the group is stunned to find out that Fred's uncle Bobby is a celebrity chef Bobby Flay that Fred never knew was famous. Big B shows them around and while giving the tour, points out a portrait of Fred's ancestor, Edward Flay, whose disappearance and the rumored ghost sightings following it are the reason that the inn has been closed for decades and decades since. People had heard him scream Red Ghost just before he disappeared, so the monster that now haunts the inn is called the Red Ghost, and it is sincerely the scariest monster in anything Scooby-Doo related I have ever seen. The shit is straight out of Bloodborne and the hissing sounds it makes are terrifying. The film's sound design overall is so fire compared to every film ranked beneath it. Some of its jokes are pretty solid too. Only one way to find out. Have we talked about LASIK? Yes, and I'm still not a candidate. It's got some cute cats, a hedge maze chase, some pretty solid pacing, and all the interactions with the groundskeeper are super fun. On the whole, though, it's still really poorly written. A good portion of its second act feels like nothing actually important is happening, and most of the main characters the gang interacts with are just celebrity chefs playing themselves, which makes for a pretty high barrier to suspend one's disbelief because the film necessitates them constantly reminding you of it. Its music is unremarkable at best, and in between its few really solid jokes, there are broad 10-minute swaths where nothing lands. In the end, the Red Ghost was Henry Metcalf, a town historian whose work would be made obsolete if it were discovered that Edward Flay was actually a spy for the British, which he secretly theorizes he is and believes could be proven by something in the inn. But it turns out the parchment papers Edward left his descendants were inscribed with lemon juice, which becomes legible again when exposed to fire. And although at first it seems to confirm that Edward Flay was a spy for the British, upon comparing the papers to military movements at the time, the gang discovers that he was giving the British false information as a double agent for none other than General George Washington. He didn't yell Red Ghost when he was captured, he yelled Red Coats. As far as Scooby-Doo wrap-ups go, the gourmet ghost undeniably swings for the fences, and for that, I respect it. Next up, Big Top Scooby-Doo. Trumbo is not fake like some strong man's, eh? <laughs> I'll say. The gang are in Atlantic City for vacation, and while Shaggy wants to see his favorite metal band perform, Fred wants to go to the circus. The film cold opens on this werewolf jewel heist, and then Shaggy, while in the van, mentions that the lead singer of his favorite band also thinks of himself as a werewolf. So it both establishes the film's monster and its first plausible suspects really quickly, which sets it off at a nice pace. So anyways, there's something really played out feeling about carnivals and circuses if I'm not running around them killing stuff with my boys. But I do love the intro's very Halloween-y paper cutout credit sequence. I'm unsure exactly how to explain it, but it gives off Coraline vibes, so points for that. This one is played as a pretty straight up comedy mystery, but in spite of that, it is aggressively unfunny. Whoa! Was that your mom? And it contains my least favorite subplot in any Scooby-Doo movie ever, where Shaggy and Scooby pose as a trained animal act, and then Shaggy gets this weird ego about him because the crowd thinks he trained Scooby, and he starts treating Scooby genuinely pretty poorly, which doesn't really bring anything to the table in terms of story development, and is actively unpleasant to watch in a way that I don't think was very intentional. Honestly, I think it should be okay to say you like a shitty movie just because werewolves are cool. Number 29, we got Lego Scooby-Doo Blowout Beach Bash. Everything wrong with the first Lego movie is still wrong with this one, but pirates are sick. Number 28, Scooby-Doo and the Monster of Mexico. Before I say anything of its quality as a story, this movie's audio is mixed in a way that makes me feel like a crazy person, and every copy I've seen is the same. I do not understand it. The sound effects are way louder than the music in every chase, and everything feels extremely flat and extremely narrow. This is one of the super low budget early 2000s films, so I can look past the Comic Sans credits and random animation flubs here and there, but again, when so much of your series' aesthetic is defined by musical chase montages, you gotta come with them heaters. And I need them to sound like they're not playing from a corner store Bluetooth speaker. Speaking of feeling crazy, this film features some of the most unhinged line reads in the entire series. The answers to all your questions can be found in the past. Oh, and did I also mention you're in grave danger? Uh... If you don't, the gods will seek revenge themselves, and I caramba, mi amigos, you don't want to see that. And these fit 
pretty well actually, because after the 40 minute mark, when we transition into the museum, Monster of Mexico transitions from a substandard Scooby-Doo movie into a violent salvia trip, reaching a fever pitch with what I can only describe as Scooby-Doo meets Shadow of the Colossus. You guys remember that Adam Sandler movie about 9-11 where he plays Shadow of the Colossus with Don Cheadle? Boy, is a stab, and that's the bird. You wanna shoot him, get his attention. All right, all right, good job, all righty. And let me pluck him right in the uterus. <laughs> Aim what? Respect. Also, the unmasking in this one feels way more fucked up and mean than the others because the reveal is that this guy's wife just doesn't love him. Charlene, I thought you loved me. Oh, would you wake up and smell the Cafe Lake Chera, you pea brain romantic? Them crackers. Number 27, Scooby-Doo and the Samurai Sword. I would give anything to be in the production meetings for this one. The gang are in Japan because Daphne's participating in a martial arts tournament at a prestigious academy with her friend Mayumi. Unbeknownst to them, the previous night, the Tokyo Museum of Ancient History was broken into by the Spirit of the Black Samurai, their most recent exhibit. Pretty boilerplate stuff in a setting I personally adore, but the film's flaws become apparent almost immediately. This is the first Scooby-Doo movie set in Japan, and our first Japanese character's first words are Nani, Sugoi, and Banzai. Uh, and the film doesn't really rise above that bar that it sets in the first couple minutes. Sort of like how Return to Zombie Island Island feels like a bad movie with a cool one happening behind it, Scooby-Doo and the Samurai Sword feels like a cool movie with a bad one happening inside of it. Rather than going for a more comedy heavy approach, this is a straight up adventure film, complete with ancient prophecies, multiple fight scenes, a dragon that wields a katana, and cyber ninjas that chase the team as they follow an ancient scroll's riddle in a hover jet. Like a lot of its foundation is genuinely really fire, and Daphne having a lot of hero moments in this one takes it a long way as far as enjoyability goes. The animation and fight choreo throughout this are great, but the film is plagued with hammy, borderline offensive writing and insane choices for music. Konnichiwa. Welcome to Tokyo Airspace. It's nice to meet you. What is your name? Oh no. It's almost annoying that one of the coolest Scooby-Doo movies on a conceptual level manages to be so mid in its execution. Daphne is a queen in this though. If you do things that a winner wouldn't do, that automatically makes you a loser. Hi Get her ass, Daphne. Number 26, Scooby-Doo Camp Scare. If Samurai got in its own way while trying to do an adventure, Camp Scare got in its own way while trying to do a horror. The gang travels to Camp Little Moose, Fred's summer camp from when he was a kid, for a vacation and to serve as camp counselors. When they get there, they find out that it's been all but abandoned because of an urban legend come to life in the form of an axe-wielding maniac who was once a Little Moose camp counselor, wreaking havoc on the forest. From the jump, a lot of this film's aesthetic choices sets it apart from those that preceded it. It opens on a POV shot of the moon from the perspective of an indiscernible monster hiding behind tall grass, and the scoring that accompanies it is really overwhelming and almost suffocating in its intensity. This is something this film does exceptionally well throughout. Conveyance of fervor and speed through the combination of music, animation, and sound design, which are both things Scooby-Doo films tend to fail at evoking particularly well. The super overt inspirations for Camp Scare are Friday the 13th and Meatballs, and I think to its detriment, it didn't quite lean into its horror roots enough to excuse its almost total lack of humor, especially when playing on the Meatballs snobby rich kids versus the poor kids cliche plot detour. About 25 minutes into the film, a second monster appears, the Fishman, this time an urban legend from the Rich Kid Camp. And another 20 after that, a third, the Spectre, rounds out the film's roster of monsters to a solid three. And this is, to me, one of the film's biggest goofs. None of its monsters are even a little scary looking because they feel really underdeveloped and go against the entire point of spooky urban legends and why the films based on them worked in the first place. You barely ever get a clear look at them until the crescendo of the film, sustaining the sensation that they're always watching and leaving their capability to do harm ambiguous. Camp Scare does the opposite. I'll give it this though, the reveal that their haunting of the area was to scare campers away from an underwater city beneath Big Moose Lake with a mobster's buried treasure in it is sincerely really cool. And I loved the sunken town square as a set piece. If they committed just a little more to one side of the Scooby fence, this would have been a banger. Number 25, Scooby-Doo Pirates Ahoy. I don't like anything about this movie, but pirates are sick. 24, Scooby-Doo Adventures the Mystery Map. 
Okay, hear me out. I know this probably seems like kind of a weird pick to hold above 25 other movies, but this shoestring budget puppet theater Scooby film is one of the funnest that I watched in my entire marathon. Its intro slaps. It's the only film to take place in the pup named Scooby-Doo timeline. It's a treasure hunt story. They recycle music from the previous films to save money, which is funny. And the way they convey the gang's prevailing traits is just really cute and fun to watch. Maybe I just have brainworms, but extremely low budget puppetry that necessitates really sharp writing and cut to the bone runtime is a lot more fun to watch than really long Lego commercials with impressive lighting. Shout out to pub named Scooby-Doo, by the way. I don't know what it is about the Scooby-verse and the people who work in it just hating puppies, but like most of the company's animation team left after its first season. So it's cool that so many years later, it's getting a bit of love. <laughs> I want to find that monster and shake his hand, if he has one. Anyone who makes Scooby's life miserable is a friend of mine. <laughs> Man, fuck Red Herring. If I catch you at the Coolsville GameStop, we're going to have problems. Where's my beanie? 23, and this one pains me to place it so low. Scooby-Doo and the Reluctant Werewolf. Shaggy turns into a werewolf and he does it reluctantly. This one makes me so sad because I specifically started marathoning Scooby-Doo movies to watch this. I remember it being so sick when I was younger and for some reason it just never occurred to me that this could be something nostalgia would cloud my judgment on. I have no idea why. Needless to say, wow, this is not as fun as it was when I was 10 and happy and slept a normal person amount of hours. First off, this is maybe the worst opening of any Scooby-Doo movie. It has such a weird, like, lazy narration over it. Tyler, Tyler County, County, USA. USA. A, a funny, funny race is in progress. In progress. The quality of its animation is super low compared to the other two Scoob films released in the 80s, and its script is, like, so bad, it feels intentional. One of the funniest parts of the movie is when Shaggy transforms into a werewolf, and it's just, like, two minutes of him gaslighting his girlfriend, Googie. Don't you growl at me. Growl? <laughs> I didn't growl at you. You did too. Did not. The song Party Time for Ghosts and Spooks goes crazy and Dracula is easily the best part of this film. Maybe it's just because I was really tired and had done nothing but watch Scooby-Doo movies for like four days straight by this point, but when he forces Shaggy to crash into the swamp with all the crocodiles around him and he just laughs and goes, I'm such a dirty guy. I lost my fucking mind. <laughs> I'm such a dirty guy. It's maybe the hardest I've laughed the entire year. It's just too good. Also, love how he says Shaggy. And I have brought you, Shaggy. Anyways, I was sure this would be my fave going in, but it ended up being pretty bad. Luckily, the concept of wacky races but with Halloween monsters is strong enough to keep it afloat in the middle of the pack. 22, Mask the Blue Falcon. Scooby-Doo as Dynamut is really cute. Number 21, Scoob. So earlier this year during the pandemic lockdown, it came out that Warner Brothers were going to release their newest feature film digitally alongside a limited traditional theatrical run. And because of that accessibility, my entire timeline was filled to the brim with people unceremoniously tearing this film apart for like a week straight. And maybe I just sustained too much brain rot from watching 42 other Scooby-Doo movies before I got to this one, but I kind of loved it. The film opens on Venice Beach, while California Love, not a remix of it, but the actual regular licensed track, underscores a series of establishing shots of the boardwalk, while gaggles of kids and their families smile and laugh together, enjoying some sanitary fun in the sun. I love how this is always how movies try to paint Venice Beach, when in reality, it's like 30 different guys trying to put their respective animal or reptile on you, and at least one strung out crust punk kicking stall doors open. Anyways, Scooby as a pup runs this Greek place for their kebab, and while he's making his escape, we're introduced to Kid Shaggy as a no friends dipshit loser. I don't like calling him that, but the film goes really hard on the no one likes him thing for like three minutes straight, to an extent that I'm pretty sure they want you to feel that way. Uh, this is probably my biggest gripe with the entire film, is that through it, even though on paper all the plot beats are really fun and it has some excellent set pieces and solid jokes, it does this thing that I can only describe as Madagascar toing it. Like every emotional beat in the film is amplified in the same way to maximize how effectively it communicates to us whatever we should feel at that time. But it's so blatantly lazy and unnaturally melodramatic every time that it tips over into just feeling really absurd and takes you out of the story a bit. In fact, it's almost frustrating when you feel it sort of working on you. <laughs> Soft? I've never had a bed before. In fact, I've never had anything before. 
Fuck you, I cried. I watched that at 3 a.m. and it made me cry and I was so annoyed. Puppy Scooby is built like my rescue dog. I had to pause it and pet her for 10 minutes. Not cool. Scoob is another crossover film, the second featuring Blue Falcon and Dynamite. But of the many that exist within the Scoobyverse, this is definitely the most skillfully put together as far as it being an actual crossover is concerned. Warner Brothers described Scoob as the first entry into their Hanna-Barbera cinematic universe, because of course it is. And normally that's enough to make me not want to engage with your movie at all. But its construction makes it pretty palatable. It's Blue Falcon and Dynamut's film as much as it is Scooby and Shaggy's, but creating these characters as emotional analogs to one another allows the film to only have to meaningfully develop one of these characters in a given scene. Also, Dee Dee Skies is so fire in this, and for the first hour of the movie, you're kind of like, Dee Dee from Captain Caveman and the Teen Angels? But because it establishes itself pretty early as a Blue Falcon crossover film, you sort of resolve that she's just an homage to this character, if you remember her name at all. But then they meet Tracy Morgan, Captain Caveman, and you're like, hey, yo! Oh, I know it's kind of garbage, but it's my garbage. Also, the Dick Dashley reveal was great. One of the best antagonists in a Scooby Doo movie, period. Jason Isaacs killed it. The way they set the group up as kids and then age them through a montage of iconic monsters they've encountered is really cute. And I love that for once they start with a tone being, we're gonna commit to Mystery Inc. all the way because like way too many Scooby films begin with them hanging it up. And it gets so old, so quick, that seeing the opposite for a change instantly won me over to whatever adventure it was going to take me on. Even if some of its jokes are excruciatingly culturally detached by about half a decade, because that's how long it's been in development for, and you can't trust 40 year olds to write teens referencing contemporary media. It just doesn't work. It will never work. Please talk to your kids, oh my god. Anyways, overall, Scoob slaps when it's not bogged down by lazy writing. I feel like the biggest hurdle for Scooby-Doo movies is to justify itself being watched over episodes from its past, and this one definitely accomplishes that. Number 20, Scooby-Doo, Shaggy Showdown. This is another one where as a film, it should be much lower on the list. Like its writing is lackluster, its monster totally squanders its potential to be exciting. And as a mystery, it's not even particularly interesting. I just really like that it's a Western. When you watch so many movies in the same series, any major change is inherently a really exciting one. So it earned its keep with the horses alone. I bit that from Jenny Nicholson's Land Before Time video much better video than this one. It's intro song is top five in the series though. Number 19, Scooby-Doo, Moon Monster Madness. Yes, finally a space movie. Mystery Inc. wins a lottery to go into space as part of a PR campaign by an eccentric billionaire whose success only tangentially relates to his own talent, but who the populace perceives as a genius inventor maverick jack of all trades. He's only a few Evangelion tweets away from our very own. Velma learns that Daphne had actually tested the highest out of the group on the astronaut adequacy whatever you take to prove you're smart enough to go to space test. This is, to Velma, a crushing blow because from her point of view, she's no longer the brains and if she doesn't get to have that over Daphne, the one who's already considered to be the hot one as well as an overall more charismatic and socially graceful person, then what does Velma have anymore? This is, of course, a flawed way of thinking, but allowing them most of the film's runtime to explore this conflict of egos makes for some really compelling moments of growth for each of them. I also love the references to 2001 A Space Odyssey and the massive influence it took from Alien, down to the alien life truther aboard the ship with them being named after the film's director, Ridley. Story slaps, theming slaps, music slaps, and overall, this is a really fun time for being a 90 minute long Elon Musk diss track. Pay your fucking taxes. Number 18, Scooby-Doo in Where's My Mummy? Oh my God, this one bangs. We open on Cleopatra fleeing a Roman siege in 41 BC and being entombed beneath the Sphinx with her treasure and an army of her most loyal servants to defend it from intruders for presumably the rest of time. Jump to present day, Velma is working with a team to restore the Sphinx and finds the necklace that unlocks the treasure. I love the way this movie tees up its adventure, not only because the actual mystery and its setting are really cool, but because we usually don't get to see Velma shine outside of her usual pocket of mystery solving. So having her be the impetus of the story taking place while utilizing her genius to help a prince at one of the most significant archeological sites on the planet is a really exciting side of her that I wish was shown more often. What puts this so high on my list though, isn't how the mystery begins, but how it ends. In this one, Velma and Prince Omar are the monsters. They devised an entire fictitious curse, complete with turning them into stone just to keep colonist grave robbers from doing any more harm to Egypt's history. 
Also, I'm pretty sure this is where Scoob Riders got the idea for making Scooby the descendant of Alexander the Great's dog, because in this one, he's misconceived as Anubis, but because it's like the Scoobyverse, they call him a Scoobus. Um, next we got Scooby-Doo meets the Boo Brothers, the very first Scooby-Doo movie, and it's still good. Shaggy learns that his uncle, Colonel Beauregard, died and left him his estate, and the rest of the film is Shaggy, Scooby, and Scrappy, by which I mean Scrappy entirely by himself, solving the mystery of where his uncle's treasure is hidden. First of all, we got the young lord himself, Scrappy, in the mix, you already know it's about to go up, and the intro song is without question the best one in the entire Scoob canon. I scare goblins, ghosts, and ghouls, hooky owls, or bats. Grown up folk and little kids, I even scare my cats. <laughs> So many things about this movie are so stupid, but it presents itself so confidently that it's hard to take it in any other way than another reason to love it. Like Shaggy's uncle who just died is a Confederate soldier that had to have lived in like 1810. The servant Farquaad is way too young to fill the inherited creepy familial servant role, but his actor is going 110% on his performance, which only makes it more uncomfortable to watch. And due to the rest of the gang not being there, on top of the Boo Brothers doing entire Three Stooges bits instead of helping, Shaggy has to become the voice of reason out of necessity, which feels almost identical to the episodes of It's Always Sunny where Charlie is the straight man. It's just goofy seeing Shaggy call a room full of happy ghosts and nerds and then smash their mad villainy LP, but there's a quality to it that's sort of irreplicable in the later works. Its color palette is one of my favorite out of any of the films, and I love that this set the tone for every Scooby-Doo movie that followed, feeling like they were made a decade prior to when they were, without exception. Number 16. Scooby-Doo and the Legend of the Vampire. The gang are in Australia for vacation after solving a mystery on their cruise across the Pacific. And after sightseeing in Sydney, they decide to travel into the outback for the Vampire Rock Music Festival. But when they get there, they find it in disarray as most of their contestants have either been abducted by vampires or left in fear. The vampires in this are some of my favorite monster designs in the series. The Yao Yahoo in specific is almost like a Scooby-Doo take on Chernabog from Disney's Anastasia, complete with the Tony the Tiger arm cross, which I really fuck with. And its writing throughout is measurably better than many of the entries in its series. Its conveyance of everything feels really natural, and it's one of the only Scooby-Doo movies to successfully fake me out on who the monster really was. It has this like really weird score, it almost feels like Ratchet and Clank music, and it was actually composed by Gigi Moroni, the composer for Metal Gear Solid, which isn't really a point for or against it necessarily, I just think it's a really cool connection. Altogether, this is a really solid Halloween watch. The Hex Girls are back, you got spooky rope bridges, looming rock structures, most of the film takes place at night, the gang wears costumes, there's a regressed secret door in the side of a wall that someone leans against and opens. Pretty much all you could ask for in a direct-to-video Scooby-Doo movie from 2003. Number 15, Scooby-Doo and the Ghoul School. Another of the 80s trio movies and a big step up from Boo Brothers in pretty much every way possible. I don't think this can be beat setting-wise. Personally, this is basically my dream, living in a foreboding but ultimately benevolent castle with really heavily themed rooms. And I also appreciate that this movie establishes Shaggy driving something other than the mystery machine as a staple of the trio's trilogy instead of a one-off thing for its first entry. Shaggy was swapping whips in the 80s more often than Bulma. Seriously, bro is in a van straight out of Mass Effect. It's so hard. I think this is also Scrappy's best movie because he totally matches the excitement for being in a cool vampire mansion that you'd kind of want a character to have, whereas Shaggy and Scooby are locked into their default panic responses. Because of this, in spite of it being the first film where the monsters are very much real, its tone throughout feels really balanced between creepy and lighthearted in a way that makes it a really solid Halloween watch. Also, it ends with Scrappy rapping over a dance between the schools. And there's Miss G with Colonel C grooving to my melody. Yo, it's not for? Scooby-Doo and the Alien Invaders. Finally, we're talking about my boy, Jim Sinstrom. Alien Invaders is the third entry in a quartet of films directed by Senstrom, Warner Brothers animation royalty, who had worked as a character designer on four different Scooby-Doo series in a myriad of other projects, including The New Adventures of Johnny Quest and Superman, Son of Krypton, before being given his own film. And all four of these were animated by Japanese studio Mook Animation, imbuing them with a really unique visual edge over much of the rest of its canon. 
The gang is driving through Roswell, New Mexico, when a sandstorm forces them to unknowingly drive on a government land, where a UFO forces them to crash, leaving them at the outskirts of a small town. One of the reasons Sandstrom's films are so well remembered is that he always made it a point to put the team in genuine peril. The threats are never fake, and the way it's handled in this film in particular is really interesting. The introduction of the aliens in this film is really fun, and in spite of it taking place in the dark, it makes it known pretty quickly that this is tonally the lightest of Sandstrom's four, and this is because this is the most emotionally painful of the four for anyone in the gang. Shaggy and Scooby fall in love with a girl and her dog, Crystal and Amber, and as they discover that the aliens they've been dealing with are fakes trying to ward locals off from discovering a fresh vein in a mine beneath the desert, it's revealed that the real aliens were actually Crystal and Amber the whole time. The film spends a ton of time doubling and tripling down on how happy Shaggy and Scooby are with them, so this revealed during its apex a confrontation with the government employees actively trying to real deal kill them hits surprisingly hard. And the fact that his writing and its pacing manages to balance this as well as it does for the film to still end on a vaguely positive note is really cool. Also, and this is with all of Sandstrom's works, I really love that he gives Scooby-Doo the additional talent of being a master mimic, capable of contorting himself into really complex impressions as a means of communication instead of simply making him talk more. Maybe a hot take, but I like this interpretation of Scooby a little more than most of the later iterations where he can just straight up have entire comprehensible conversations. If you do it right, most of them do not. Oh, I know, but you'll get over it. Yeah, but it's gonna take a long, long time. Number 13, Scooby-Doo and the Loch Ness Monster. Mystery Inc. traveled to Lake Loch Ness in Scotland to visit a castle owned by Daphne's ancestors and her cousin. As the series progressed, they started to pivot away from Shaggy being the only member to be given greater plot significance by virtue of random Ancestry.com matches. And I love that Daphne's first shot at it is in one of the most significant monster sighting regions in the entire world as the inheritor of a giant castle perched above a mystical lake. Also, this one's music is some of the best throughout, but its intro in particular goes crazy. This has got to be like my favorite opening shot in the series as well. The blues and the purples with this insane castle cutting through the moon with the mist. Honestly, maybe my favorite shot in general in the series. It's just really captivating and also sets itself apart from most of its lineage by actually opening on a wide of where the rest of the film is going to take place. Loch Ness has one of my favorite monsters in the series as well, both in design and its sound design. It reminds me of the dragons from Tales from Earthsea, almost, and I adore that both the characters in the film who are obsessed with Nessie get their moment to shine. This is an interesting middle ground between your masked monster movies like Scott Gerald's and your real monster movies like Jim Senstrom. Because even though the Loch Ness we see throughout the film isn't real and in fact are duplicate fakes, the film ends on the scientist Sir Ian Loxley, who up till this point was a staunch denier of Nessie's existence, showing the gang pictures his sub had taken that when combined with Professor Pembroke, the Nessie fanatic scientist and main masked monster of the movie's photographs proves the Loch Ness monster monster might exist. As they're leaving, Velma says she's glad they couldn't prove it doesn't exist because I don't know. Maybe some mysteries are just better left unsolved. And I love that. Number 12, Scooby-Doo and Batman, The Brave and the Bold. The film follows Mystery Inc. and the Mystery Analysts of Gotham as they try to crack the case of the Crimson Cloak. But it soon becomes clear that finding out who the Crimson Cloak is is an unsolved case for Batman as well. And they pit the Justice League against Mystery Inc. and Batman, leaving them no other choice but to solve the case and prove their own innocence. Oh, this one is so good. The Brave and the Bold is one of the best Batman series because it nails the pacing and levity of his earlier detective comics and the Adam West run based on them, with all the brooding mystique and macabre aesthetic flair we've come to know from the more contemporary entries into his canon. This is probably the most genuine crossover film that I've ever seen, because it divides focus and prominence between Batman and the other DC characters in the gang in an exceptionally balanced way that allows it to flow really naturally. With the exception of the few times someone straight up mentions this is taking place in Gotham, it never feels like Shaggy, Scooby, Velma, Fred, and Daphne are out of their element with these characters, and it manages to curb the holy shit that's Black Canary effect 
pretty quickly. I love Velma's competitiveness with Detective Chimp throughout, and Aquaman's characterization throughout Brave and the Bold is my favorite version of his character. Just a big magic himbo. Even though I just said it does well at downplaying the significance of these DC characters melding into this Scooby-Doo movie, it does have one of the best ensembles of heroes and villains out of any DC movie, <laughs> largely assisted by the fact that our leads not only go to Arkham Asylum, but crash through the wall of a dive bar filled to the brim with iconic Batman villains. Its climax, where Mystery Inc. saves Batman wearing the suits of his former sidekicks, is genuinely so cute, and it ends on a really solid Scooby Dooby Doo. Holy Scooby Dooby Doo, Batman. What more could you ask for? Number 11, Scooby Doo and the Cyber Chase. This is the second Senstrom on the list, and probably the least Halloween-y of the four, but I'm pretty sure I've watched this more times than any other piece of Scooby-Doo media at any point of my life. The gang are visiting a college to see their friend Eric's video game based on Mystery Inc.'s mystery-solving exploits. When they learn that the computer lab he, his fellow student Bill McLemore, and their teacher Professor Kaufman conduct their work in was attacked by a mysterious phantom virus. Something I missed at the time, presumably because I was like four, is that this movie's antagonist is actually a physical representation of the anxiety leading up to Y2K. Its potential threat as a monster is blindsiding the world's computing grids and wiping all of its data, sending the 21st century crashing down in a ball of static. I also didn't catch that this is very much Tron but Scooby-Doo, but again, Four, Scooby has a second bit in the Sinstrom films that I really love, where usually multiple times per movie, different human characters talk about the dog in the group, and Scooby goes, Rob? <laughs> And I love that Senstrom just maxed it out on this one. It's small, but again, it's the little things in this quartet that early on really set them apart from the TV series in the previous films. The Phantom Virus's design is super distinct from pretty much any other monster in the Scoobyverse because due to his threat being an immaterial one, he didn't really need to be particularly tall or broad or ghoulish. Because of this, what we're left with is this extremely angular, almost Green Goblin-esque apparition. And for my money, he's one of the most memorable monsters the gang face throughout the films. Now we're getting to the real heaters, the top 10, the cream of the crop, the S plus tier, the upper echelon of Scooby-Doo cinema. Number 10, Scooby-Doo, Legend of the Phantasaur. I really like Legend of the Phantasaur because in a lot of ways, it feels like the first Scooby-Doo film to really make itself feel close to contemporary. Like I said before, most movies in the Scooby-verse give off the vibe that they're about a decade removed from any given time, regardless of their efforts to showcase characters using recent technology. In Phantasaur, however, it takes on a lot of qualities of early 2010s cartoons like Adventure Time and Regular Show with a much faster, much more abrupt style of editing to accentuate its comedy and a more absurd writing style that gives what would previously be regular interactions with the occasional straightforward jokes a level of meta humor to them in a way that isn't trying too hard. Is that a dog? Broadly speaking, yes. Right. Red balloons? Shaggy? A balloon filled with ghosts? Is there anything else to talk about? In the world? Answer, no. This is also, in my opinion, the anti-return to Zombie Island because it takes an equally unorthodox approach to the Scooby story formula, but in a way that is super fun and fresh, it doesn't deprive its viewer of the opportunity to actually watch a movie, which kind of sucks because this is by the same director. What happened, Ethan? The film opens on Shaggy suffering an extreme form of panic attack after being scared during the gang's last mystery, and this doctor insists that he avoids stressors, in specific anything scary, basically forever. First off, it's really cute to me that instead of dropping Shaggy, the gang instantly decides to stop solving mysteries and take a vacation with him, resolving that they'll just pick up a new hobby together because they're such good friends. Again, anti-return to Zombie Island. Once they reach their destination, Shaggy is hypnotized to lose all sense of fear when he hears a trigger word, and the rest of the movie, which involves the gang facing a giant, fire-breathing ghost T-Rex and its army of raptors, as well as a biker bar fight scene, Shaggy is the protagonist, both as his panic-prone self and his sexy alter ego. Shaggy, if you will. Yo, as a side note, why is it every time they give Velma a crush in these movies, the guy turns out to be insane and then gets arrested? Give my girl a break. Anyways, the animation and camera work in this goes crazy as well, and overall, I love it. Number nine, we got Scooby-Doo Music of the Vampire. Scooby, Shaggy, Daphne, Velma, and Fred decide to take a well-earned vacation after solving a cockroach monster-related mystery, and Velma decides to take 
take them to Petite Chauve Souriville, a town that hosts a yearly vampire festival called Vampire Palooza. When they get there through a series of bizarre events, a long dead vampire lord comes back to life and spends the rest of the film trying to claim Daphne as his vampire bride. Right off the bat, this is easily a top five intro. Jim Cummings narrates and then sings us into the movie as a bayou dweller named Thule, and it's fan Fantastic. Especially because we never really get the Aladdin treatment with this series. Also, later in the film, Shaggy and Scooby run into him in the woods and he cooks them gumbo with a blowtorch. This may be a bit small, but I love the transitions in this one as well. Like the smoke fade from this introduction into the first scene isn't huge necessarily, but it's the little things like this that make a film feel like a lot of care was given to it. Anyways, we've been through adventures, horrors, sci-fis, races, and at least five potential copyright lawsuits. So at some point during 2009, -ish, Warner Brothers decided that it was time they gave me specifically what I want, which is why Music of the Vampire is a Twilight inspired animated Scooby Doo musical. There's this troop of like fake performing vampires who accidentally summon the vampire lord at the beginning of the film, and their leader, Bram, is dangerously horny for its entire runtime, which I appreciate on a commitment level because everybody knows every good musical is built on the back of thirst. The fourth song in this is Shaggy singing to Scooby about how good of a friend he is. And again, maybe it's because I watched 24 Scooby-Doo movies leading up to this, but I cried? It's just a really sweet moment, and it sort of reminds me tonally of nobody else but you from a goofy movie, which is like, Suspended in Crystal will always be one of my favorite movies of all time. I love the little screen split while they're singing, by the way. This is fire. Whoever came up with this at Warner, please know that you are appreciated. Uh, what else? Fred gets to stake machine gun, and it's like the coolest device he's ever invented. And it works semi-properly for once, which I feel like is a well-deserved W for him. Also, why does the wedding song sound so much like the end of Gangsta's Paradise? Looks like we're in time for the wedding. Wedding? I wish someone had told us. We don't even have a gift. I've got a gift. Crazy. Number eight, chill out, Scooby-Doo. Everybody knows snow levels are the best ones, okay? Sidewinder, Containment, Snowbound, all of Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, all of Northrend, Kunlai Summit, part of High Mountain, all of Winter Spring, all of Dunmoro. Yo, how many of these are too many? The ruins of Alteric specifically. Chill out Scooby-Doo cold opens on a climbing expedition in the Himalayas. And when a snowstorm hits, the old white guy leaves his Sherpa behind to continue his search for the abominable snowman. This opening is crazy for a few reasons. One and most importantly, this opening is super hard. I know I keep saying it, but music is the most important ingredient in making a good Scooby-Doo film. If what they're running to isn't hot, I do not want to watch it. Second, for all we know, this is the first time we watched a dude kill someone, possibly even himself, in the Scooby-verse, which is extremely jarring when you've only been locked in for like three minutes. And third, and this one's a little personal because it's my list, this intro combines like three of my most irrational fears. Being caught in a blizzard, acute mountain sickness making me go insane, and large indefinable animals capable of killing me, in specific on mountaintops or deep underwater. Which is fire, because for me especially, this film tees itself up exceptionally well. I love its split beginning with Shaggy and Scooby airdropping into the Himalayas while Velma, Daphne, and Fred are in Paris. And this time around, more or less all the side characters, even Minga, who turns out to have been the monster to keep Del from Loch Ness stuck on the mountain to keep her company, are really lovable and sweet. This also has some of the craziest environment design, like Shaggy and Scooby literally go to the lost kingdom of Shangri-La. Also, the minecart segment goes crazy. This movie feels like a 3D platformer. I don't know exactly how to elaborate on that, but I hope you know what I mean. The abominable snowman itself is a fantastic monster as well. Environmentally, it has a lot going for it in the same way Nessie did, where, you know, you have these dense sheets of snow to obscure it from your view, but in spite of its scale, its movement speed is like deceptively high. Like, I love these anime antagonist as jumps or performs whenever it enters or leaves the scene. You got alternate outfits, the movie ends with Fred in a jungle biome, there's a snowboarding segment. Literally tell me I'm not describing a 3D platformer. Number seven, Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. Okay, this is the first Sinstrom Scooby-Doo film, and it's also the first Scooby-Doo film to feature its full cast, and the first to open with its original Scooby-Doo intro song. 
and it began the trend of Scooby-Doo movies and series opening on the team being broken up or in the process of breaking up. You know what they say, you just can't beat the originals. Rather than opening on this sort of weird, bitter note most of the later Scooby-Doo films that try this approach do, Zombie Island opens an unclear length of time after the team has already broken up, and within a minute of establishing why they split up, because they were tired of never finding any real monsters, we cut to the gang reuniting to surprise Daphne and join her on a tour of haunted American landmarks in the hopes of finding some genuine ghosts and slash or ghouls. The following unmasking montage is arguably the best in the Scooby canon. I love it. After being overheard talking about how they still can't find any real ghosts, Lena Dupree invites the gang to stay at the plantation she works at, which she says is definitely haunted. I don't know what it is, but consistently Southern accents are like the worst in these films. Not just Sandstrom's, but like a number of Scooby-Doo movies in general feature awful, awful, not even trying levels of bad Southern accents for no reason. And I have to assume it's just a running bit at this point. The environments throughout this one make it one of the most aggressively Halloween-centric Scooby-Doo films in the series, and I absolutely adore it because of that. The shots of the moon, the colors it employs to evoke this marshy, sort of fall forest meets a graveyard aesthetic. I'm in love with this one's visuals from beginning to end. Also, this is, I'm pretty sure, like the only time Velma gets an at least implied love interest that isn't a serial killer. Overall, this one is a must watch. That man, Sinstrom, is a genius. Number six, Scooby-Doo and the Curse of the 13th Ghost. Okay, I gotta admit, the way this story actually starts bothers me so much. It opens on this really fresh, almost like sepia tone flashback with narration over it of a young Vincent Van Gogh and his partner Mortifer hunting down the titular monster of the film. And then Mortifer seemingly gets deleted by some of these side ghosts and Vincent finishes his narration with this little recap of how Daphne, Shaggy, and Scooby had this little side adventure of like accidentally re-releasing the ghosts they had sealed and then traveling around the world, getting them back into their chest. All of that is so sick, I love it. This would probably be my number two on the list, if not for what follows it. After this incredible intro, we cut to present day as Mystery Inc. stops who they believe to be the perp in their latest mystery, only to realize they had the wrong person by mistake for this like really contrived and unfunny reason where the guy ran from them because he has a fear of teenagers. And their local sheriff forces them to retire again, and the gang spends a solid seven minutes of runtime just selling all of their Mystery Inc. stuff, including the mystery machine. It'd be one thing if this was like a one-off occurrence in the series, but for whatever reason, writers kept doing this, presumably to recapture some of Zombie Island's energy. And this run of like three or four Scooby-Doo movies in a row, including Return to Zombie Island, do this back to back to back and have this fixation on this like really unrewarding macro subplot that forces every movie to immediately sap itself of whatever enthusiasm or momentum it had just built up in its opening. And this is one thing to do to a movie that's sort of mid or like actively terrible, but it's another thing to do it to one of the most enjoyable adventure films of the entire canon. Please fuck off. Anyways, that aside, everything after the nine minute mark is pretty much golden. While they're holding their garage sale, they find the crystal ball Daphne, Shaggy, and Scooby used on their adventure. And in that very moment, Vincent contacts them about capturing the final ghost. I love this setup because in the older trio films, there was never any mention of the rest of the gang. And even as a kid, I always wanted a scene where Shaggy tried to like explain reluctant werewolf to Velma or, or Boo Brothers to Fred or something, you know? And this is pretty much an entire movie movie of that. Also, similar to Where's My Mummy, 13th Ghost gives off some pretty heavy Indiana Jones vibes again, but I think it totally nails it this time. Daphne gets a new fit and becomes the de facto leader, and along with that comes so much more confidence in a way that she's usually not given. You know, for once, Shaggy, Scooby, and Daphne are the hyper-competent ones who have a strong grasp on the situation, while Fred and Velma struggle to keep up. And the exploration of how this affects their emotional dynamics makes for some really genuinely sweet moments. I just love how much more funny and alive Daphne feels in this. She's very much given the role of Indy, complete with his one-liners and unrelenting spirit. And Vincent has got to be one of the best supporting characters they've ever made. He has all the terrible puns of Dracula from Reluctant Werewolf, but they're all delivered with this sort of gradually more obvious self-loathing hyper-awareness that the puns he's making are terrible, which sort of fits the quasi-father figure role he seems to have taken over the three, and he's also an actual wizard, which helps his case 
a lot. This is also maybe my favorite planting and payoff in a Scooby-Doo movie because very early on in the trio's explanation to Fred and Velma, they mentioned this character named Flim Flam they were with, like an old friend they miss, which is down to the way they phrase it meant to be a parallel for short round. And then later into the film, after they've all been split up, they introduce this younger teenager who helps Fred and Velma on their leg of the adventure until they all run into each other in this temple and have a classic, you know, Scooby-Doo, one half of the group thinks the other half is the monster mix up. And he goes, did you say Daphne, Shaggy and Scooby? And they're like, flim flam. And it's such a weird, beautiful, incredibly unique moment within Scooby-Doo as a franchise. I know I'm probably phrasing that a little oddly, but this is like such a cool writing choice to have made. Like, you know, they toss his name out a couple times and then tie it back together an hour and six minutes into the film. Also, he acknowledges Scrappy. Finally, someone says it. Shaggy, I've never seen you wear a shirt that isn't red. Huh? Yeah. And Scooby-Doo, you haven't changed one bit. You know, I thought that red band was familiar. Well, I guess the gang's all here. Except Scrappy. What's a Scrappy? It took 39 movies for anyone to put respect on Scrappy's name. Asmodeus is a fantastic monster. His voice and his movements are immediately so imposing and his design accentuates them so well. Nolan North killed his performance as him. Final thoughts? Banger. Next, we got the unmistakable, unbreakable Scooby-Doo Abracadabra Do. After solving another mystery, Velma gets a call from Mama Dinkley, asking her to check on her younger sister Madeline, who's attending a college for magicians, Whirlin Merlin Magic Academy. And when the gang arrives, they learn the school is in dire straits because a giant griffin has scared away everyone who attends it. Usually when a family member of the gang is added to the canon, it's in a really impersonal, object-like sort of way. Typically, they don't even appear on screen, and if they do, it's through flashbacks or pictures. Pictures. Their existence begins and ends as a catalyst for Mystery Inc. to travel somewhere new. But in Abracadabra Do, Madeline is a main character. And the way it explores the relationship between siblings and specific young adults a few years apart is my favorite part of the movie. A lot of the interactions remind me of my big sister and I. And in a series that has never carried itself as relatable, per se, it's a nice change of pace. Its art style is really sharp and just very charming and bold, and I kind of wish they had stuck with this into the rest of the 2010s. Its line art having a heavier stroke in combination with this super clean simulated depth of field allows our characters to pop against the backgrounds really nice. And combined with this soft orangish purple light filter, it gives an almost dreamlike quality to its visuals that I really appreciate. This softened color palette lined with much sharper, much darker line work than many of the previous entries also reflects the shift in maturity that Abracadabra Do brings. It's not night and day, you know, but the writing in this film carries a pretty distinct tinge of edginess with it. Uh, one thing I do hate though, is that the mystery machine has a GPS with like, a personality? A few movies in the series try this in varying iterations and degrees, and I do not understand where the compulsion to make the van talk to the team comes from. Only one does it kind of well, and it's still like the worst part of that movie. Also, Madeline's scream when she's taken by the Griffin in front of Mystery Inc. is like extremely jarring. It's like the most authentic scream in the series by a huge margin, and it just kind of caught me off guard. <laughs> Ultimately, Abracadabra Do is about love and its many different forms and contexts, and it's for that reason more than any other that I think it ranks so high on this list. Similar to Haunted Hollywood, the antagonist of this one is actually one of its supporting characters, and their intentions aren't particularly sinister, or at least in Marlin's case, he isn't really evil. He was just jealous of his brother Merlin, the owner of the school, always being the one in the limelight. And the man who funded him, Calvin Curdles, just wanted to buy the castle to win back the heart of Alma, its housekeeper. Also, this is only one of three films where Shaggy is given a love interest and the only one to both flesh out her character and allow it to blossom. Madeline's infatuation with Shaggy allows him to be shown in a completely different light to the one that we're used to seeing him in and the one he's used to seeing himself in. And as his self image is bolstered by her, he's imbued with the confidence to actually be the hero of this film because the true cure to fear isn't hypnotism, it's love. Also, this was Matthew Lillard's first job voicing Shaggy in a feature, and he killed it. Literally the best addition ever made to the series. Kate Micucci is Velma Strong second. Number four, Happy Halloween, Scooby-Doo. First off, I'd just like to say, fuck this movie. 
I literally finished Scoob and thought I was done with my marathon, and then while looking up Scooby-Doo music on YouTube, found the trailer to a new film that had been released after I started my marathon, and I cannot even begin to describe to you the anguish that washed over me in that moment. Not that I don't love the Scooby-verse, clearly I do, but I had just watched roughly 65 hours of Scooby-Doo features with nothing in between. I haven't launched World of Warcraft since September. I am in pain. And what's worse is it had the audacity to be incredible, so I can't even dislike it. Happy Halloween opens on Elvira's Halloween of Horrors Parade as Mystery Inc. is in the middle of capturing their next perp, the Scarecrow. This is another crossover film, but the ball is very much in Mystery Inc.'s court. This is actually a really interesting blend between a classic crossover and the newest series incarnation of Scooby-Doo, Scooby-Doo and Guess Who, where each episode a different special guest like Mark Hamill or Halsey helps the gang solve a mystery. Scarecrow is the only fictional character who crosses over into the film, but the very real Cassandra Peterson as her persona Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, and Bill Nye the Science Guy serve as supporting characters throughout. And it's honestly a lot more charming than it probably looks at a glance. They try to do the talking van thing again for some reason, but this time it's just Bill Nye facetiming the gang through the updated Mystery Machine X. And in fairness, it offers some pretty funny exchanges. What do you think, Mr. Nye? Do you have any science-based wisdom to impart? Well, Velma, if you stacked every ruler on Earth end-to-end -end between the Earth and the Moon, they would all drift away before you could measure anything at all. Okay, yeah, I mean science wisdom that applies to our current situation. Oh, uh, well, no, then. Nothing yet. After the gang captures a scarecrow, he tells Velma they're both being set up, to which Fred, Daphne, and Velma respond with understandable confusion. And just after this, Shaggy and Scooby come crashing through the scene having just ran from a horde of mysterious, sentient pumpkin monsters, nearly ruining Mystery Inc.'s shot at a solid interview with their local news. Velma tells them off with her usual monsters don't exist spiel, and this makes for a really interesting interpersonal conflict between her and the boys, because just as they reference the boy who cried wolf in the introduction to the film, Velma similarly ignores their completely genuine warning, only to then be swarmed by the same horde minutes later. Happy Halloween's music is fire, by the way. I love that its intro in specific begins diegetically from Shaggy and Scooby, starting it in the mystery machine, while there's a battle going on in the background. The imagery in combination with the Diet Jackson 5 playing over it gives off some really strong Guardians of the Galaxy 2 vibes, which I really appreciate. Its pacing is especially tight, and I think overall it's the most exuberant film in the series. Series. My biggest gripe with it, honestly, is literally a single line from Scarecrow near the beginning. And so the fate of Crystal Cove was left in the capable hands of the avocado toast generation. It's just such a lazy line to throw into an otherwise really fresh script and to ascribe to an otherwise hyper intelligent character. But on the upside, at least he was put in chains immediately afterwards because if you're writing avocado toast jokes in your movies as an easy dunk on Gen Z, you should be put in chains too. Also, Daphne has these weird, almost involuntary ad libs where she just yells decade old slang at situations, but they at least made me laugh in a sort of why is this happening sort of way. So I'll let it pass. And it's forgivable considering how fun the rest of her character is in this one. Daphne wants to become Elvira's understudy as a mentee of darkness. And I don't know, this is another film where Daphne in specific is given a lot more liveliness and a kind of goofier, more quick-witted demeanor, which makes her dynamic with Fred a lot more endearing. For instance, when they're bouncing off each other during this insane Scooby-Doo meets Fury Road caravan car chase. Velma frees the scarecrow during the chase, and at first it seems like he disappeared, but he comes back to save them while yelling, there is no time for bravery, which is maybe the hardest thing you could ever say before fighting a pumpkin. My favorite part of this film by far though, is that rather than solving their mystery and defeating the zombie pumpkins ravaging Crystal Cove with like a one-off trap or deductive reasoning, the gang ends up just smashing them all in this really beautiful ensemble last stand Halloween graveyard massacre with every character showing off their respective strengths. Also the perp reveal in this one feels like it was written specifically for me I think because they could tell how much I hated the sheriff subplot they kept recycling. The villain is the sheriff but he wasn't actually the sheriff, he was a perp behind an older mystery mystery who disguised himself as the sheriff to discourage mystery ink and now he's gone forever thank god literally the most annoying character they have ever introduced Holy shit. Anyways, after the pumpkin massacre is ended and the mystery is solved, the gang walks back to town and then joins a costume party to spend the rest of their Halloween together having fun. 
It's like the coziest ending in the series. This is a 100% must watch, especially during fall. I feel like we should be able to maintain the Halloween vibe until like December. Thanksgiving doesn't really have like an aesthetic, you know? Besides genocide. Number three, Scooby-Doo, Frank and Creepy. Two things you should know about me is that I am currently nursing a smoothie addiction. Shoutouts to Robex. If you're in LA, get the SIE Energizer. That shit will change your life. And my favorite Halloween movie of all time is Mel Brooks in Gene Wilder's Young Frankenstein. So it's a no brainer that this would be near the top of my list because this is very much a Scooby-Doo take on the masterpiece. This is basically the same setup as Boo Brothers, except this time it's Velma's turn in the ancestral inheritance seat. And instead of a plantation, she's getting a castle. The film opens on Daphne hosting this live stream while the various members of Mystery Inc. join to hang out, when a lawyer claiming to represent Velma's family interrupts the call and then summons them to his office. After he reveals that the castle carries a curse with it, that anyone who comes close to it will lose what they love most, the gang leave and are nearly killed by a car bomb that destroys the mystery machine. Another thing the 2010s films really like to do, aside from the recurring sheriff bits, is continually destroy or otherwise strip Fred of the mystery machine and then just have us watch him fail to cope for 90 minutes at a time. And I gotta admit, in this one, they really make it work. For some reason, the title sequence in this one feels like Dexter-y? I don't know, normally intros dictate the quality of the Scooby media, and this one isn't bad by any means. Like, it's fresh, it just feels weird, I guess. Regardless, the rest of the music in this film, especially its scoring, is top notch. The film totally nails the precarious tone of genuine mystery turned over the top black comedy, and its editing and comedic timing hold their end of that balancing act perfectly. Velma explains to the gang on their train ride to Transylvania, where the castle is, that the reason she doesn't want it is because her real last name is Von Dinkenstein, which was Americanized when her ancestors arrived at Ellis Island. Her great-great-uncle, Baron Von Dinkenstein, was rumored to have created the monster that inspired Mary Shelley to write Frankenstein, and the reason Velma committed her life to solving mysteries is because she wanted to get away from her family name and their supernatural curse, because everyone who inherits the castle tries to replicate Baron Von Dinkenstein. Frankenstein's experiment and is driven insane. The first night they arrive in the town, after each of the other members explore and are eventually surrounded by a torch-wielding mob, the Dinkenstein family servant Yago shows up and tells the gang that Velma has gone insane. Yes, this is definitely Velma's film. She has a ton of hilarious lines, she is a central driving force of the story, and she also gets the best costume change in the entire series next to bowling Scooby and goth Daphne. Bride of Frankenstein, Velma. Also, there's a gas leak segment that I relate to. Shoutouts to the broken weld in our stove. The villain reveal in this film is also super cool because it's not just the monster or a duo, but like the entire town's leadership are revealed to be perps from some of the original Scooby-Doo Where Are You episodes, which is so sick. And the resolution is one of my favorites in the series. Guys, don't you see? Of all the things we lost, beauty, confidence, the joy of eating, logic, none of it was what we loved the most. <laughs> we love each other the most. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Number two, home stretch baby, is Scooby-Doo and the Witch's Ghost. Jim Sinstrom's Scooby-Doo magnum opus. The film opens on the gang in the middle of solving a mystery in a natural history museum at night. Already super, 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 super sick. I have no idea why they haven't set an entire film in a museum yet. I feel like especially off the back of like Night at the Museum or whatever, someone should have greenlit that. Because even an extremely bad movie can be made enjoyable if it's set inside of a museum at night. Scooby runs up a T-Rex spine and then these mummified Vikings crush it beneath him. And just the imagery over the classic Scooby-Doo Where Are You theme music is super intoxicating. This is easily the best opening in Sinstrom's works. After Ben Ravencroft, a famous horror writer, helps the gang catch their men, Velma gushes over how poggers he is, and then he invites them back to his hometown of Oak Haven, Massachusetts. When they get there, though, the town is different from how he remembered it. It's been turned into a tourist attraction by the mayor, built around the execution of Ben's ancestor and suspected witch, Sarah Ravencroft. Whereas films like Frank and Creepy or Happy Halloween go full 
full sicko mode with the gloomy color palettes, which is Ghost Ops for these really warm, really cozy fall tones for its landscapes. And its hues throughout are exceptionally more vibrant and deep than many of the other entries into the series. Probably closest to Legend of the Phantasaur outside of Senstrom's own works. This works super well once the day cycle within the film transitions to night at about the 20 minutes mark. The sunny quaintness of the town is replaced with deep brooding blues, purples, and blacks to reflect the danger the gang is now in. And this is also why I think Ben Ravencroft is the best designed antagonist in the series because his colors embody the same juxtaposition. Warmth on the outside, darkness on the inside. Of all the Senstrom works, this is without question the most visibly evident that it was animated in Japan, if that makes sense. Like, I learned Mook Animations made these films because so many of Ben's movements and the way the camera moves in accordance with them during the film's final confrontation specifically feels straight out of a Yoshiaki Kawajiri OVA. This is also the film that introduced the Hex Girls into the Scoob canon, which is enough on its own to warrant a top five spot because they are perfect. Earth, Wind, Fire, and Air is the best outro song in the series by such a huge margin it doesn't even seem fair to compare the others. Tim Curry kills it as Ben in this, and I love that the film gets the fake out unmasking out of the way super early this time to allow Ben's vindiction to carry the rest of the film forward. The way he gradually reveals himself as this like unhinged, obsessive hellbent on finding Sarah Ravencroft's journal and the gang's growing uneasiness around him because of that is one of the more subtle antagonist reveals in the Scoobyverse, and I really appreciate that Witch's Ghost takes this route. Maybe the film's only fault is that Sarah Ravencroft speaks in this sort of broken old English that isn't really true to the time, and Tress McNeil, her actress, is like audibly uncomfortable reading her lines. But it's just funny enough to be enjoyable, and its delivery is still intense enough to not fully break immersion. Bitches in 19th century Massachusetts be like, thanks thee, who art thou? Thank thee. Thou canst not know what my bondage hath been like. Who art thou? Also, I love how fire Velma's closing line is. Ben Ravencroft's last book is one the world will never buy. 10 Evil Tim Curry laughs out of 10. So, we're down to the last, the definitive, objective, categorical, incontrovertible, best Scooby-Doo movie ever made until Scooby-Doo in King Arthur's Court drops later this year because there's no way a movie with that title isn't gonna be the best out. Number one, Scooby-Doo and the Goblin King. Mystery Inc. are spending Halloween night at the Coolsville Halloween Carnival, and after running into a magician, the amazing Kretzky, who refuses to let Scooby into his show, Shaggy and Scooby retaliate by humiliating him and revealing the secret to his tricks. Kretzky storms off and swears his revenge, and the gang are soon kicked out of the carnival. Later in Kretzky's tent as the gang are trick-or-treating, we learn that he actually wants to be able to wield real magic. As he monologues about his lifetime spent searching for the mystic arts, a fairy enters his tent and attempting to toy with him, flips one of his tomes to an entry about a goblin scepter, giving him the idea to seek it out and harness its powers to take over the world that has so callously wronged him. As the fairy continues to try to toy with him, though, he ends up knocking her out with a fly swatter and then realizing what she is steals her magic, becoming a very real, very evil wizard. Whereupon he appears at the magic shop Shaggy and Scooby had just wandered into and been serenaded about the existence of magic by its also a real wizard owner. Mr. Gibbles, stealing all of his spells and turning him into the White Rabbit from Alice in Wonderland. Mr. Gibbles tells Shaggy and Scooby that they must travel to the land of Halloween spirits to stop him, or the powers of Halloween night will take over the world and turn everybody, including their friends, into monsters. This is maybe the best Halloween movie. Like, Young Frankenstein is my favorite to watch on Halloween, followed by The Black Cauldron. But in terms of theming, you know, when we're talking movies that take place on or around Halloween, or were at least released for Halloween, I think this is my new favorite movie of all time. First of all, its casting is crazy. You have Wayne Knight as the amazing Kretzky, Tim Curry back in his first and only other Scooby-Doo role in nine years as the Goblin King. You have Jay Leno as a talking jack-o'-lantern that saves Shaggy and Scooby's lives, and Lauren Bacall, one of the greatest actresses of the Golden Age, and Russie Taylor, the longest ever standing voice of Minnie Mouse, playing witches. Beyond that, its visuals are second to none. It's another real monster film where everything that's taking place is actually happening as it appears. The first to do so after Sinstrom's run in the 90s, and it takes advantage of this better than even his films did. There are witches, fairies, goblins, ghouls, mummies, vampires, skeletons, jack-o'-lanterns. This film 
feels like it is actively trying to out Halloween the entire series. And it does so in a way that feels super unique for the subject matter. The jack-o'-lantern isn't a scary monster who tries to attack them. Neither are the witches. The conductor who takes them to the spirit world is a skeleton. The werewolf they meet when they land is a sweetheart when he thinks they're monsters. Even the headless horseman isn't trying to hurt anyone. He literally just can't see and wants to meld with the jack-o'-lantern for the night. It's like every Halloween trope imaginable turned on its head, so all of its elements can at once feel creepy and spooky and mystical, but charismatic and friendly and full of energy. It nails the dim-witted duo shtick with Glum and Glob, who, by the way, is voiced by Jim Belushi. The way it blends elements from anything from Alice in Wonderland with its framing and parallel worlds to Harry Potter with regards to people's fear of saying the Goblin King's name out loud lest he's summoned is fantastic. This is also some of the best camera work in the series. This tracking shot of Scooby and Shaggy riding the flying broom by itself is more engaging to look at than some entire films in the canon are. Its set pieces are crazy. When they take the coffin elevator down to the Goblin King's underground castle and it pans up, I literally yelled let's go at like 2 a.m. because it's such a sick and fresh take on the creepy castles littered throughout the films in the series. Everything this film does, it does so freshly. Later in the film, Scooby and Shaggy try to take the goblin scepter from the king and they fail and are sent to this tower dungeon. And like Shaggy gives this heartfelt monologue about how they actually tried to be brave this time and they did their best. And then the fairies and the broom the witches gave them and Jack the jack-o'-lantern comes to save them. And it's like, I don't know, no other Scooby-Doo movie does this. Like, it's a genuine They Came Back style rescue you'd expect in an adventure film, specifically usually only executed well in super long adventure films. But everything in this movie is so endearing, it achieves the same effect in like half the time. The monster designs themselves are fire. The side bits where we check in with Fred, Daphne, and Velma are hilarious. In specific, I love the running joke that Velma simply cannot stay conscious while something so fantastical is happening. Ooh. What lonesome trickery is this? And its resolution, where the gang defeat Kretzky and we learn that the fairy he had captured was actually the Goblin King's daughter, and the Goblin King is actually really sweet, and everyone is transformed back into their human selves, and only Shaggy and Scooby are allowed to keep the memory of the knights, is my favorite ending of any Scooby-Doo movie I have ever seen. Which is all of them. I think what makes this my favorite isn't just that it's incredibly funny, or that it has really tight editing, or that its setting is so good that it's literally otherworldly, or that it out-adventure films even the 13th Ghost. Rather, it's that it can do all of that and took me out of my own head better than any others did. And I'm probably not speaking alone here when I say right now, that is just what the figurative doctor ordered. Uh, so that's it. Every Scooby-Doo movie from bottom to top. I can finally rest easy knowing Goblin King is a Halloween banger to end all bangers. And I'm glad you were here to do so with me. I know this is super different from my usual voice behind the screen, super heavy on the editing shtick, but I know how it feels to spend holidays alone. And I get the feeling a whole lot of us are this year. So I just wanted an excuse to maybe keep you company for a while longer than usual at the expense of like polish, I guess. I didn't even proofread this. I hope you've been doing good. I hope you got some candy or like energy drinks or Percocet, whatever makes you happy. And truly, deeply, from the very bottom of my gamer heart, I wish you a happy Halloween. Next year will be better. But for the time being, grab some blankets, guilt order seven pounds of candy from Amazon Prime, and watch some cool movies. I mean, that's what Halloween's really about, right? Sometimes you gotta forget about reality for a little while. I don't know. It couldn't hurt. Anyways, thanks for watching. Happy Halloween. And have a good night.
for watching. Big, big, big thank you to my patrons for making this video possible, uh, especially these guys. And a very special thank you to Kazaria, Bushido Boy, I Punched a Sandwich, Beatrice Brown, HK47, Nico Hatch, Samurai Felix, Elias, Leander Schmidt, Mark McNair, Lila NB Nerd, Ryan Brockett, Megan Lloyd, Enrique Nieto, Victor Frank, Bobby Blanchard, Jojo, Dylan Cooley, Jason Scott, Deer GF, Brian Kane, Luke Jenkins, Donald Gorey, Patches, Alberta Nava, Zachary Wilson, Stephen Kausler, Theseat, Tristan Holly, Etrolian, Jason Yu, Tyler, Ben Siegebrecht, Sam Penn, Blade Lord Yuda, Anzu, Miranda Shana, Ethan Fry, Sean Chand, Sinuet, Dusky Dancing, Derek McDonald, Emma Brownlee, Carson Davidson, John Dow, Exotic Spoon, A Werewolf, Solar Hernandez, Stoop Andrews, Nicholas Bloom, Ricard Bergstrom, Daniel Elizald, Daniel Martinez, Kevin Truong, Rollback Flapjack, Sandre Gravdal, Ghostly, Tavian Nelson, McKenna Gadiant, Nick Orjuela, Solomon Bell, Almighty Dwarf, Jabiji, Cloudy, Scrubbin, Menu, Rick W, Rafael Da Silva, The Prostate Negotiator, <laughs> Sham Kumar, Unknown, Grady B. Olson, Planet Boobs, <laughs> Reverse Polarity, Bean, Aiden Sales, The Queen, William Rulon, David Maynard, Danian Dimitru, Sawyer Coast, Jake Pitch, Jordan May, Fox Hunt, Jeremy Wilkins, Fog Knight, Sarah L, Nathan Martin, Peyton Williams, NCPD Medic, Christian Wells, That One French Guy, Koala Bala, Saint, Nicholas Lewis, SSGT Snuggles, Dustin Treese, The Last Samurai, Elizabeth, Ayoshi, Scribe Scribbles, Brian the Epic, Albert Lee, Johnny B. Good, Ryan Randolph, Liam the Child, Clunt, Senior Gambino, Enrique Gomez, Meshock Brooks, Zian Employee, Preston Michalizio, Gregory Babcock, VHS Daydreams, Holden Williams, Stephanie Langdew, Tyler Eaton, Walter J. Taggart, Patrick Foster, Vintage Me, Ethan Boyd, Evan Jones, Spencer Neptonia Lynch, Yuri Voice, Granul, Lauren Gudaku's Flag, Jack Dixon, Tyra Rogers, Amy Wen, LW, Uneducated and Enthused, Benjamin Reed, Ram Lico Grady, Dante Cantone, Kintsugi, Manda Panda, Luke Hudson, Space Ghost, Madeline Foley, Alex Fenn, The DJ, Lakota Rawls, Kevin Thurber, Quinn Whiteley, Heaven Johnson, Diego Arras, Simon Riley, Grand Shock Trooper, Ivan Dolvich from Jagged Alliance 2, Buttershield, Maximum Crash, Kane King, The One Who Memes, Lewi, A Recusant, I Am Badgers, Spoons, Luigi Murray, Michelle Wen, Mohamed El Zafri, Avid, No Community, Tristan VS, Robert Whaley, Straffin Nathan, Robin Namini, Skelly V, Alexi Aro Olavi, Tristan Marino, Joshua Kotomol, Blake Demby, Sergeant VR, Gavin Miller, Long Hyun, Ho Shin, Shane Vino, Mumblecore Max, Yolane, Jacob New, Rory, Charles J. Boyle, Travis Osborne, and Winter Fay. Let me know what you thought about what I thought down below. Make sure to like and subscribe if you feel like seeing more slick vids like the one you just watched. And if you really want to help out, consider becoming a patron. Every penny helps me try to make this thing a full-time gig. Anyways, love you, love you, love you. Have a good night. <laughs>